So welcome, everybody. Um, for those who didn't meet me yesterday, I'm Karen Mundy, and I'm the president-elect of the Comparative and International Education Society. You can't hear. Oh, gee. OK, good. I'm Karen Mundy. I am the president-elect of the Comparative Education Society and a professor and associate dean at the University of Toronto. One of the few honors that a president or incoming president has is selecting the annual Neller Lecture. And this year, I'm very, very pleased to uh, have been able to secure for us a talk from Rukmini Banerjee. Those of you who don't know her work, Rukmini began, as she told me in an email exchange, with her studies in Chicago, and at that time, became very, very interested in the, in the lives of schools and schooling. And she later went on to become an innovator, a leader, and I think somebody with both a level of ambition for changing and reforming educational systems that's uniquely balanced with a level of humility and an ability to listen. She has, of course, developed the ACER platform, the annual status of education report platform that has become world renowned for its innovation in linking citizens and accountability to, to improvement in the quality of schooling. And her work with ACER has been scaled up or replicated in many other countries around the world. It's a nice counterpoint to our presidential lecture yesterday to note that our president, Hilbert Valverde, studied with Rukmini in Chicago. So uh, Rukmini is going to give us a very different view, I think, of accountability politics, one that is less about the global forces driving accountability and more about the kinds of citizenship and civil society interventions that might utilize accountability in ways that yields real change on behalf of children. I'm delighted to have Rukmini with us. We'll be followed, she'll, she'll give her lecture and we'll be followed by a panel of civil society actors discussing uniquely, I think for some of us, the Millennium Development Goals from a Southern or a civil society perspective. So please join me in welcoming Rukmini. I'm really happy that she could come. Thank you, Karen. As you know, um, in India, we are heading into general elections. And in case I stood for uh, political office, here is my campaign manager. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really very honored to be here. Uh, I think in the last 30 years, I've been to CIS conference once. This is my second time. And the previous time when I went, it was so small that I think you could have it like in a Best Western or a little little hotel. So it's wonderful to see this whole family just growing and growing. Um, I think I share something with, the, with your president. We both went to the same graduate school, which after we finished was shut down. Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know what exactly that means, but you always have to explain that you went to a graduate school that does not exist anymore. So perhaps it's just a good thing that I'm not a researcher anymore and not an academic, but it's really a privilege to be here. Uh, many of my colleagues back home who are very forthright said to me, you're going to give a lecture? Like, on what? Uh, and I took Karen's uh, words literally. She said, um, you know, talk, talk about whatever you feel like. Uh, don't make it sound like a conference presentation. And since the last two days, we've been uh, trained very well to stop talking in 12 minutes and not go over time. So this is indeed an honor to be able to actually have some time to talk to everybody here. Um, what I thought I would do is kind of just take you um, uh, through a couple of learnings uh, that we as an organization in India have had and luckily for me, and I didn't think this would happen so far away from home, there are people in this room who've been parts of some of those journeys. So if nothing else, I hope to be able to amuse some of my friends in the audience and see if their recollections match mine, and if we learned the same things together or if they were different learnings. So as Karen said, I started uh, you know, uh, my 
um, professional life in Chicago. And I was like many usual graduate students. In India, you're expected to sort of do all your education for years. So I guess I have 27 years of education. And after you finish doing all the degrees at home, then you go abroad to do some more degrees. And so, you know, I did that. Uh, luckily for me, I didn't get financial aid in the economics department at the University of Chicago, because if I had, I would have probably gone a different route. I had, uh, so I had admission in the, uh, in the education department. And I have to thank both Chicago and the department for really, uh, you know, bringing my interest into schools in a way that I certainly didn't have when I was back in India. Uh, at the time, this was the mid, uh, mid 80s, there was a lot of things going on in Chicago, Chicago school reform. I lived in a neighborhood that was deeply involved in the goings-ons of the schools. And again, coming from India where, you know, you are very interested in education, but you don't have those kinds of neighborhood links. I think it was a big education for me to just be in Chicago at a time when these community links with schools were being revitalized, rethought, reviewed. And the universities played a major role in, I think, those relationships as well. But in addition, I kept feeling uh, that I was missing out on the action on the ground. You have this impression when you're in school that all the action is somewhere else. Uh, I don't know if that is true or not, but I decided that I should go and experience what is happening in Chicago schools myself. What was the way to do that? So I walked, uh, for those of you who are familiar with Chicago, the university uh, is in the south side. And in those days, people said south side with more significance than they do now, because much has been gentrified in the city, I think, since then. Uh, and so I walked a couple of blocks further south to the nearest school that I could find. And I walked in, and people were quite surprised. I guess you don't have walk-ins in those kinds of schools. And uh, I offered myself, and the principal was very kind, and he had a nice chat with me, and he said, why don't you come back? And I did this trip two or three times, and finally he said, frankly, we don't know what to do with you, so what would you like to do? Uh, and so I ended up actually doing uh, some volunteer work, actually teaching. Very soon I was actually taking a class three times a week for seventh graders in this school, on the south side of Chicago. And I think it is that experience really that got me really thinking about what our schools in India would be like. I had had no such urge while I lived in India to walk into my neighborhood school and offer myself in any form. And yet, while doing that in Chicago, I learned a lot. One of the things I learned was that the kids simply couldn't place me. They said, you're not white, so clearly, but you're not black. No. Are you German? <laughs> you know, like, are you something else? And so, you know, we struggled for two years with the seventh grade, and finally they decided, well, whatever, you're Ms. Banerjee. You know, it doesn't matter, I don't need to. I taught them uh, uh, writing composition, and I think I had insights into these children's minds in a way that perhaps if I had taught physics or chemistry, I wouldn't have. And we had these very interesting uh, discussions in the class, and I still remember this young boy who in seventh grade already had a personality, and his personality was to be the bad boy. And uh, one day they had to write, uh, I forget what, but he wrote, actually wrote a poem, and the poem was really touching. And I made perhaps the mistake of reading out the poem in class and asking the children to guess who wrote it. And through this whole process when it was discovered that this young man who was clearly wanted to be the bad boy of the neighborhood could actually be a poet, it caused a lot of confusion for everyone because it was somehow crossing boundaries of the type that neither the boy intended to and neither his, his friends. But I think through the kids and through the community of that school, it gave me a real insight into the issues of urban education, into personal lives, into the roles that the teachers had to play in communities of that sort. And frankly, I wish I could go back to the school, I wonder if any of them are still there, to thank them for the fact that it really raised in me the curiosity for really getting into schools into India. It's a bit of a roundabout route to get into schools in India, but I'm glad that I was, I was made to see uh, and be curious about these things. So after my many years of education, I returned to India. 
and uh, uh, Having come from Chicago and seen what the Chicago public school systems research department was up to, I imagined that I could go to Bombay, now called Mumbai, and go into their municipal school system, which was roughly the same size as Chicago, and see if I could belong to their research department. So first I spent a week looking for the Bombay Municipal School Research Department, <laughs> and came to the conclusion there was one, and there was one person in it. And when I went to meet her, she was deeply suspicious of me because I think she thought I wanted her job. <laughs> uh, in the end, I, uh, uh, this, you know, I could see that there was really no place that you could come into. There was no, but there was no job, and there was no way to get into what is would be India's one of India's biggest school systems. And it's around that time, uh, the organization that I work for now, Pratham, was just starting. And the mandate of Pratham was to work very closely with the school system, and that's, that's where I started. And I realized as I worked with Pratham in those early years, that really all those years of education had to be, uh, had to be put aside in some way, and had to start getting educated all over again. And so I have to thank Pratham as well for my first lessons, which were really in the slums of Bombay. Uh, this was around uh, 1996. Uh, the millennium year was still far away. Um, uh, and I think at the time uh, the organization was coming together, there was a mandate to work with the school system. And the goal was every child in school and learning. And we worked a number of ways. And one of the things we could see as a new outfit that uh, while the school system had gaps, had deficiencies, <laughs> But perhaps the place for a new set of people with you know, not very many resources to begin was in the early childhood space. Lots of migrants into the city, dislocated families, people who are trying to get their roots. And in this big shuffle of coming into a very big city, crowded city, a difficult city, children would often get lost. And so perhaps starting with early childhood centers uh, was the place to begin. Because our view was that if every child had the opportunity to go to some kind of a preschool, universal first grade could be guaranteed. And so that's where we started. Uh, being a, not a native speaker of Marathi, which is the local language there, I was sent to an area, and also everybody knew that I was way over-educated, so I needed some serious education quickly. So I was sent to uh, one of the larger slums, which, were, uh, which had a lot of Hindi-speaking people, because then I could communicate directly. And one of my first assignments was to work in this very large and very new slum, which for those, there must be people in this room who are familiar with Bombay, it is on the way from Bombay to Pune, and it is where all of Bombay's garbage is dumped. And so it is on the edge of this huge garbage dump that uh, my first assignment was. But I wasn't alone. Unlike in graduate school where you are alone, here you had a team to work with, and there were always people who were teaching you all the time, and because I didn't know Marathi very well, all my colleagues felt that I needed some accelerated learning at all times. <laughs> and I even remember a young colleague saying to me, where have you been all these years? You haven't even learned the right language. <laughs> uh, the young woman with whom I worked at the time, I remember her very, very well. Her name was Ghazala. And our job, hers mainly, and mine to support her, was to see whether we could set up little community-based preschools in that slum so that every child in that kind of uh, uh, space of about, uh, I, I can't, I don't have a good sense of space, but there were about 500 households in that area. And could we have enough little preschools to cater to all the children between the ages of three to five in that area? And you know, over a period of a couple of months, we were able to find uh, young women who were right from that community who were willing to hold these little preschools uh, wherever they could find space. And most people here didn't even have a roof over their head. It was all under plastic sheets. And so many of our preschool centers were exactly in places like that. Very soon, we had about 30 centers running, each of whom had 15 or 20 little kids. We couldn't have more than that because the spaces were really little. And it had to be where the kids could walk by themselves. Um, this young girl, Ghazala, at one point, once these little preschools were set up, said to me, you know, I have a problem. I don't like the fact that many of our kids don't have proper clothes. So what do you think? Can you do anything about it? Now, this would be 30 little preschool centers with at least 
20 kids in each of them, which meant providing for clothing for hundreds of children, certainly wasn't part of what we could do. And I very frankly said to her, I don't think we can do that. She looked a little disappointed that I was so-called her superior and didn't have any solutions. Two weeks later, she came back and she said to me, the problem is solved. <laughs> How did you solve the problem? She herself came from a slum, which was just a little bit further away, not as badly off as the people that she was in charge of, but not incredibly much better off. And so she said, I went to my neighborhood and I told everybody, this is terrible. We have almost 500 kids. They need clothes. So come on, everybody, give me some. And she was able, single-handedly, to provide clothing, at least for the children, maybe not all 500, but for those who didn't have at least some clothes. And I think this led to some confidence in her own ability to go beyond the mandate that she was given. A Couple of weeks later, or months later, she said to me again, so now they have clothes. But you know, if this is preschool, and you guys call it preschool, they should have a uniform. <laughs> I um, said, okay. She also said, I know you can't help me. <laughs> so I will organize this myself. I just thought I should keep you in the know because for some reason you seem interested in what I'm doing. And so what she did was she picked up, she got the phone number of the local politician and she called him, took a couple of tries to call him and she told him the same thing, <laughs> that these are people in your constituency and they need uniforms. Now, whether the politician actually provided the uniforms or not, she spoke to enough people and was able to get some amount of fabric, which she then converted into little uniforms for these kids. So we have these children in these uniforms going to little preschool centers under plastic sheets. But I think what it did was, A, it uh, convinced girls like Ghazala who were really products of the local community and of the local school, that they could do quite a lot. And it convinced all the others who were in her purview that if they all got together, they too could do a lot. And all it needed was some people strongly wanting to do something, and there could be more that could come. These kinds of efforts were not unique. At the time in Bombay when uh, uh, I used to join Pratham, and Pratham was quite new, we had 150 little preschool centers. And to me, it's very interesting because we thought we were large scale at the time. 150 preschool centers, there was no other organization in Bombay at the time that was running that many centers. From 96 to 98, women like Ghazala and others from neighboring slums through the friends and family network all came forward to say, we think that this little preschool is a good idea. I mean, literally the preschool was a person and some children and some space who actually did some little activities. It was literally that. Some people have said, you know, so did you run like a Head Start program? I don't think so. This was what exactly what it was. And people would come forth to say that we do want such things in our neighborhood. And we moved from 150 to 3,500 within the space of two years. And it all happened partly because people wanted that this should happen in their neighborhood. We had an evaluation of somebody who came from a, you know, a well-known agency that does early childhood education, who said that these preschool centers are not appropriate for children. Well, much of Bombay is not appropriate for anyone. <laughs> and so in those situations, do you say we will not have these and wait for this perfect little preschool setting, or do you go ahead with what the community can do and what the community can support. And I think that this, so we were scale when we were 150, we were on scale when we were 3,500, and I've always been puzzled by what this scale means. I think scale means just one step ahead from where you are today. Uh, I'm looking at Ward here, and Ward remembers visiting some of these areas way back then. Soon this entire preschool network around Bombay began to surface many other kinds of needs. So communities, parents, especially moms would say, you're doing a lot for these little babies, but what about our kids who are in school? What about the kids who are not in school? What are you gonna do for those? And I think willy-nilly we were pushed into thinking about what to do, just because there was such a loud voice coming, and partly like Ghazala, people believed that maybe you could help, and partly just by telling you, they could organize their own thoughts better. So in a way you acted like a sounding board or a platform 
and sometimes you were a sounding board and sometimes you were not very useful. But through many of these efforts grew a larger program which we uh, worked with the Bombay Municipal uh, System to really think about how do you operationalize this every child in school and learning. Uh, there were still a lot of out of school children in those days, children who were not yet enrolled. And from communities like the ones I've described, often it was because they had just moved from the village to the city. They hadn't yet got their moorings right. They needed some help in being linked in the right places. Sometimes the languages were misaligned. And so there was a, a room for, for, um, for mediating this, uh, this uh, space between uh, families and communities and the school system. And at the time, the school system as well could see that this was something that needed to be done by people who were attached and associated with the school system, but not necessarily part of it. Same community, and you know, I wish we could have a movie about it rather than just hear the talk, because it was very visually uh, compelling as well. In the same area that we had these, uh, the Ghazala little preschools, there was a school. In fact, Ghazala was a product of that school. And I remember the principal of that school being shocked that this girl, who was not a particularly fine product of the school, was actually become a leader who came out of this whole process. And I've often wondered that when we actually in Pratham look for people, if there was a way, rather than a CV which said what educational qualifications you had, if somebody would list out all the things you didn't do, then we would be able to hire them. Because often those are the ones who go much further than the ones who, like me, had many years of education but needed to start all over again. So in that area, imagine that all those children who were in the preschools would now need to go to school. In addition, they had older brothers and sisters who needed to go to school as well. And in, if I remember correctly, when we did surveys for just that one community, we had about another three or 400 children who were of primary school age who needed to be taken into school. Of course, they needed to be prepared and you know, brought up to some kind of a level before they could be brought in. So conducted a meeting in that local school. The local school already had class sizes of 80 or 90 or 100 kids. They already couldn't fit everybody into the, the space that they had. And this was literally the only solid building, uh, permanent building, that was on the edge of this garbage dump. Everything else was in a shanty, uh, in you know, uh, uh, housing that was plastic or bamboo or so on. And so when we had this meeting, and I remember going into this meeting very confidently, thinking that this could be one of the schools into which the largest number of out of school children could come, the principal, uh, who, with whom also I've had a long association after that, she heard me out and she said, don't tell me all this, I'm gonna call a staff meeting. How about you talk to my entire set of teachers? And I felt like, oh good, we've made an inroad. Not only does she want to support this process, but she wants her entire staff and her whole team to be along. The schools in Bombay run in two shifts, morning and evening, to be able to maximize the space. And so the meeting that we had of the teachers had 30 teachers. And when I said to them, I'm going to bring you, for sure, another four or 500 kids, the teachers were up in arms. They said, not only do we not want those kids, we want you to take away some of the kids we have. <laughs> because we have no place to fit them in, we have no resources, we have nobody who actually supports us. We are just used like a dumping ground for every child that is in the vicinity without any thought of how do you actually deliver education. And so went on a long process, and the negotiations that we reached is that at least the children that we bring you will have a certain level of learning. Now, one of the reasons, and I'm sure in this conference we've heard lots and lots about the importance of bringing learning to the center of the stage. I think one of the main reasons is everybody likes a child who's able to do something. Parents like them because you feel they're moving ahead. Teachers really like children who are learning and can learn because they're a lot easier to teach than those who don't want to learn or are not learning. And children themselves feel highly energized and empowered when they know that they are learning. And so our promise to the school was at least the children that we bring you will have, re they will not come as they are today. We will prepare them and maybe not at the grade level because almost nobody is at grade level in India. Uh, and I discovered after my PhD, neither was I. Uh, but we will bring you at a level that at least they will be ready to learn and probably have the basics. And so after several staff meetings, lots of skepticism, great deal of cynicism, 
The school said, fine, let's see what you can do. And you have six months in which to get these children ready. Uh, in that whole neighborhood, we then decided that apart from the preschools, which needed to be very close to where the children live, because when you're three years old, you need to be able to walk down you know, your lane to your preschool. But for these older children, what we called in India bridge classes, to be able to bridge them into school, we needed something more. And talking to the community leaders in that area, they also decided that that needs to be a little bit more, a, 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 a space that's a little bit more suitable for bringing more children in. So a space was found right in the middle of this slum that was empty. And soon, within about two weeks, a structure was constructed on top of that space. We need a structure because with, during the monsoons, it's difficult to operate in Bombay outside. And it was about a space that was 20 feet by 20 feet. Uh, plastic and bamboos were donated. Everybody had a little bit of extra. And in fact, somebody in that community decided it's worth paving the floor because then children can sit on a floor that is actually cemented and not of mud. Uh, I had then, uh, I remember, uh, I was approached by the local electrician who said, well, if you've built this space, you'd like to work in it at night as well. I hadn't thought of that. Said, yes, good idea. So he said, I will give you electricity. Uh, electricity in Bombay slums for the unauthorized slums, you can't, I mean, you have to get electricity. It doesn't come to you. And so I said, okay, uh, what will it cost? He said, it won't cost anything to you, I mean, to the, to the center, because when I pull the wire from the mains, it will go over many huts. And I will charge them 50 rupees for each bulb. So by the time it comes to you, actually the work that I'll have done will have subsidized. So he had a very good cost model for how to supply electricity to, to this place. And at the time, I thought this was a great solution. But much later, uh, I happened to be with a group of possible donors who were the Bombay Electric Supply Corporation. <laughs> and when they had a look at what was going on here, they were very torn about whether to support efforts like these or to just say that they would walk away. So anyway, this thing was built and we ran uh, with, again, uh, community teachers, we ran a number of classes that could take care of these three to 400 children, get them ready over the next couple of months to have them enter into school. And this whole community center actually took on a life of its own. People began to use it uh, in their own ways. Every time I went there, which was at least a couple of times a week, I would see different pictures on the walls. Everybody brought their own gods. You know, in India, we have our own gods. And it didn't matter if the gods who were sitting next to each other were from different religions, because, you know, you know if you can coexist with each other in the slums, then the gods can coexist with each other on the walls. Uh, and it, it actually took on the shape of a community center in a way that we had not really planned or thought. Story doesn't end there. I don't know how much time we have. We can go on and on. But uh, 20 minutes, OK. Uh, I have to get to the end of the story because it's a bit like a thriller. Uh, they, they... <laughs> One day, which is common in Bombay slums, very often the city bulldozes the unauthorized slums. They bring in their bulldozers and they crush everything. This is the strategy that the city uses for discouraging illegal occupation of areas that people should not be building anything in. And so I was in the area, not in this particular slum, when somebody came running to me to say that that entire area is being bulldozed. And lo and behold, when we arrived there, it was really like a war zone where these huge machines, all these men in kind of, you know, not quite uniform, but you could tell they were from the city, who were actually just simply flattening everything that was in the way. And the really tragic thing there was, that children in that area were very used to their homes being bulldozed. But they were very upset at their school being bulldozed. And they said to me, our homes have been bulldozed before, but this is our school. Can you tell them to just leave the school and just go around it? <laughs> One woman who had been a very strong supporter of what we did could see how upset I was. And I will never forget, she took me aside. Her home had just been bulldozed. She had already rigged up a little stove. And you know, in India, we feel you must drink tea that will restore your spirits no matter what. And she actually, in the middle of this mess, made me a cup of tea and said, you are clearly not used to these things. Have a cup of tea. A solution will emerge later. All of this was very upsetting to the immediate community and to the people who were involved. 
but it's not like it created a big wave in the city. These things happen in big cities. And for, if you look at it from the point of view of the city government, you know, keeping areas like this, uh, uh, you know, not occupied by illegal people is probably a good idea. But it did create some ripples, because I think that the effort that was underlying all of this was not going unnoticed. So I was summoned to a meeting in the local office of the city administration, the regional office for the area. And uh, when I went for the meeting, I wasn't sure what the agenda would be. And the chief administrative officer, I think, just wanted to kind of make sure that, you know, I, just reach out of hand of friendship, or I'm not sure what, because when we arrived and sat down, there wasn't really anything to talk about. Uh, so I said, okay, now that you've bulldozed this area, people don't actually go away. You know that, and we know that. And he said, yes, and they will rebuild. And so came the question about all these children who have to be now enrolled in the school, because that was a part of the city program. It wasn't just something that Pratham was running. And he called members of the people who were in charge of demolition in that area, and who were also sitting in the meeting. And the guys who were in charge of the demolition were very kind of not comfortable. And they said to me, why are you asking us for solutions? We are the demolition squad. We're just doing our job. Our job is not to provide solutions. Our job is to just get rid of everything. And as we talked, one of them said, OK, I have an idea. You see, when we demolish things, a lot of the material the, the bamboos and other, you know, the, the tin strips, we don't actually crush them, we put them away. Would you like some of those? We will build another school for you in a place which is slightly less unauthorized. <laughs> now, this was a huge gesture on part of the demolition department, but it clearly, it was like making a pact with the devil in some way. And everybody in the room, was grateful that people were beginning to think, but that this was not quite the right solution. And to cut a long story short, the school that I spoke to you about became the center of attention because that was a government space. They did have a little yard. And what it led was really to more construction of rooms and going higher on the space that they had. And all of this, I think, in the early days taught us that this Policy, local action, community mobilization, all of these, when you see it at a local level, mesh together in ways that I think come up with strategies which are clearly out of the box. But you need to push each other to reach solutions that perhaps are not comfortable for everyone, but are maybe slightly better off than the solutions that you had before. And I think in that way as well, uh, the next set of demolitions didn't happen very soon. I'm sure they did a couple of years later. But there was something about the work that had gone on, and I think it wouldn't have happened if the work had been dealing only with a few children. The fact that it dealt with, in the preschools, five, six hundred children, some older children, the involvement of the school, some of that, I think, did play a role in coming up with strategies that could be a little bit more sustaining over a period of time. Uh, these kinds of experiences, I think, taught us all that you need to keep pushing. Don't push so hard that people have to just run away from you or push you back. But if you keep pushing at different levels, some things will emerge, more resources arrive, and solutions can be found if you agree that the overall goal is a goal that's worth achieving. So in re-envisioning education, perhaps that is something that we all need to do is to keep pushing on the places that we can comfortably push with and make sure that we can uh, sort of take... Uh... I want to bring one rural example in as well. Uh, this also happened almost 10 years ago. Uh, it is from my own home state, which is one of the most backward states uh, in the country. It used to be one of the most educationally backward states in the country. Uh, had a period of uh, political rule which was extremely negative for at least education. No teachers were hired for almost 20 years. And around about 10 years ago, 2004, uh, there was a move from the government side to uh, uh, recruit what we in India call para-teachers. About 80,000 para-teachers were going to be recruited to be brought into the schools. And at that point, uh, we got a phone call from, by this time we had started working in many parts of India, and we got a phone call from the person who headed the education department there 
who had heard about the kinds of uh, reading techniques we used and the assessment methods we had. And he called and invited us to a conference and said, uh, I want to understand how you assess learning. So we told him how we assess learning, it's quite straightforward. And he said, I would like that assessment to happen in the state of Bihar. So at this point I said, but to what end? I mean, we can assess, thermometers are always useful, but what are you hoping to find? And is there likely to be any change? The conversation started with assessment, but it very soon moved to the fact that they were going to recruit all these teachers. And so one of the things we said is, what if you did the assessment before the teachers arrived? The state had about 150,000 teachers. You were going to now insert another 80,000 teachers. You would expect that some changes would happen simply from the availability of more teachers in the system. And as the conversations moved, it moved further away and away from the opening uh, reason for having the conversation to, so what can you do to help to improve the learning? Uh, we were quite large, but we were not a very resource rich organization. And what it turned out was that to train these 80,000 uh, contract teachers, the state was preparing 6,000 trainers. And these 6,000 trainers were going to be put into a training program to become tra trainer of trainers kind of training in 150 locations for 10 days. After which they would scatter all over the state and then proceed to do whatever they had to do. So it seemed like those 10 days were an important point to get in. And uh, we said that I think what we'd like to do is to be with you for those 10 days. And if it's possible to find some time to actually talk about the methods that we use. The state government said our sessions are all set. At least in India, we have these very set, structured sessions. And they're all printed into little booklets and every session is marked. <laughs> so that's all done. So we said, do you have lunch times? We always have lunch times. We always have lunch times and tea times. They often are longer than the actual sessions. So, <laughs> so our deal was, what we'd like to do is in each of these locations where the master traders were being trained, we'd like to step out of the building into nearby schools for an hour with the master traders so that we could practice whatever it is about the learning method that we were saying. To the state sitting in the state capital, it seemed fine because it didn't seem like a big uh, movement away from what had been planned. But there were 150 locations in the state in which this was supposed to happen. So how are we going to reach them all? I got back to my own colleagues uh, and we had a board meeting, I remember, at, at the time. And so to the board, I made a presentation saying, most backward state in India, opportunity to introduce a way to improve learning, we need 300 people to go to Bihar. Rightly, the president of our board said, and the government wants you to go. We said yes, which was kind of true. Uh, so why aren't they paying for it? <laughs> Well, governments in India have money, but often this money cannot move easily. And so I said, they really want us to come, they're not able to pay. So the board looked at me like, oh, okay. And so you want to use the money that we have to take people across the country into 150 locations for something that is not entirely clear <laughs> what it's going to lead to. So to put it in a nutshell, they were not very keen that we should carry out this effort. However, by this time, the word had spread within the Pratham network. And like my friend Ghazala, I think this is universal that young people are looking for adventure and action. I started getting phone calls saying, how much money will it cost? We'll get into a train. If needed, we'll pay for the ticket. We'll get to the state. We'll go to the location and then somebody will take care of us. And within about 10 days, more than 300 people across Pratham volunteered to make this journey. And believe me, in those days, this was like the badlands of India. You didn't just go there, you know, looking for action. You got the action when you reached there. Or at least this was the perception in much of India that this is what the condition was. Today, it's a lot better because of many things that the governments have done. Uh, so we had these 300 young people arrived. 60 or 75% were young women. We put a criteria saying that they have to know Hindi. They have to have permission from their parents. Don't run away and not tell your parents where you're going for a month. That's not a good idea, no matter in which culture you are. 
Uh, and you have to have you know, conducted some of these reading programs yourself in the area that you're coming from. 300 people arrived. We booked, uh, you know, uh, uh, I don't know what the English word is. We have religious places where you have like dormitories. So a couple of the such places in the capital city were quite taken up with what this was and gave us a very cheap rate. So people would come in, stay for two days, there would be some orientation and then they would move to these 150 locations. And literally what happened was these young people would take these older, mostly male master trainers to a nearby school. The first day was quite tough because these were master trainers. They had been training their whole life. They were teachers of a high order. There was nothing more left to learn. They knew it all. But to take them to a school and say, let's look at some children, third to fifth grade. Let's see, let's work with them for a, a, you know, an hour. And let's do this over 10 days. And lo and behold, very soon, lunch was 15 minutes. This thing was 45 to 50 minutes. And actually, the fact that you could take people work with them, I think being young helped because the combination of the young versus the experience, the energy and the experience worked. If I had tried to do it, I'm sure it wouldn't have worked. But when there are young people saying, come on, let's just go try it, you begin to want to humor them. And we had across all of these locations, firstly, not a single mishap. Very often there were two young girls and 40 elderly or older men who were the trainers. Everywhere people were taken very good care of given gifts when they left. We were not paid, but I think we received back a great deal of warmth and friendship. And when this, when this, uh, this whole exercise ended, often people asked us, so did you work with the government? Is there sustainable change? Is this going to last? Very difficult questions. Did we work with the government or did we just work with some people? <laughs> were we an organization or were we individuals? Were there going to be sustainable change? not immediately. Does change happen in a linear fashion? I mean, there were no easy answers to any of these. But I think what we did learn is that friendship and trust and warmth and seriousness goes a long way in persuading people to change their minds. In years afterwards, we've done a lot of work in this state, often with state governments. And in many cases, the relationships that were forged in those 10, 15 days have been leveraged really well to come up with the next round of things that we wanted to do. So in wrapping up, she hasn't given me the note yet, but, <laughs> but I, I can sense that I should wrap up. I think that we learned, as you can see, many things. Going to new places, meeting new people, doing new kinds of work is a huge learning. We learned that doors need to be kept open. There are all kinds of people who would like to help. They don't come in a prescribed fashion. And very often, working with young people, I find the bold ones, the ones who've had trouble, are often the best when it comes to pushing these kinds of frontiers. We have very often in Pratham no fine print. Our manuals or guidelines of action are not very detailed. But there is a clear framework of action. And I think for us, it's been very important to have some clear, visible goals that you feel are actually doable. Reaching for the stars is a good idea, but the stars are very far away. Reaching for the mango on the tree is a little bit easier as the first step. And I think that we have also come to see that not all progress is linear. You take a couple of steps forward, you take a few steps sideways, and you have to keep doing this. This business of development is not an explosion. It is a whole set of mixed up things, but as a huge movement, I think it's on a forward course. And we have to make sure that the waves move forward. And they do lap backwards, but that more and more that you go forward. The importance of policies are important, allocations are important, money is important. But I would say trust and taking people along is as important, if not more. Especially for people who work outside the government, we find that we can find resources in almost every community. But you have to look for them. You have to trust that there are people there who actually can help. And I think coming back to where I started, having done some of these things, I think gave us the confidence to carry out an effort like ASAR, which goes into every rural district in India. Because over the course of the years before that, we had learned that there are people everywhere who really want to make a change. And we feel 
very strongly and we see this in the in the learnings we've had from many other uh, friends and partners now in east africa in west africa in pakistan that these are quite similar in universal uh, bonds in every community if there are young people some of these young people want to make a change and most young people want to be part of the change and once young people in a country feel like they can make about a change i think that's the way that the world moves forward so i'm not sure i thought i should say something about the main theme of this but i think all of these things as we move forward in education there will be mdgs but i think we need some local gs as well <laughs> and i think these don't need to be either or they really can be connected and we have to believe and create opportunities often opportunities don't come platforms are not flat they have to be created take the opportunity that you get and make what you can of it because as soon as you start making something happen of it more happens than you think would have happened so i took the opportunity when karen asked me to come and i hope that i have done what you wanted me to do but thank you so much for having me come here emailed me a week ago or two weeks ago and said what do you really want me to do and i said just please tell us a story from your heart about what you've learned because what we know about you is about aser and not so much about the theory of change behind aser and i, I she's more than fulfilled that and given us also a, a, some 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 humor <laughs> which is a great thing in a in a in a keynote <laughs> um rubini is going to take a, a rounds of questions so i'll take uh, two rounds of three questions and then we're going to assemble our mdg panel so i welcome uh, hands and i'm going to select a few of them uh, now so questions for rukmini no questions no questions yes please Alan. Yes, hello, I'm Ellen Dion from Oxford University. I'm a newcomer to work in this part of the world. I'm curious to know how you get young women or in the countries that you work in to be able to get young women to travel independently to a distant place and to do the kind of work that you're doing. Is it, I mean, is it typical? Is it not typical? How do you, how, how do you, I'm working in Pakistan. I, I can't imagine this happening in Pakistan, but maybe it's my imagination that's the problem. Maybe you could speak to that a little bit. One more. Yes, at the very back. <coughs> Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Mary Van Buren. I'm from Boise. Thank you for a wonderful talk. Uh, my question was about working with the state government and uh, the government school system. How has the partnership fostered over the years to make change in the teachers that are practicing the government school system? We spoke a little about the Fahar context, but I'm sure there are more lasting impacts that are also happening. So a little more on that. Thank you. Uh, Henry Alder from Plan Bangladesh. I'm interested in uh, your reflections on how you've been able to work with the pervasive uh, corruption that is in Bihar as well as many other states in India. On the young women front, I can speak for India. I see some young women from Pakistan in this room. <laughs> Perhaps they can speak better to, to that. Um, to begin with, none of our work actually takes people beyond their community immediately. And I think for some communities, it's still a bit of a jump to come from home into wherever in the community that you're going to do. Um, I, I think having a whole group of people do it together sometimes helps. 
And from beginning to work, I remember, for example, Lucknow, which is the, the old city in Lucknow, which is a largely Muslim community. Uh, we had very similar programs to what we've described. And it started off first by having these community little groups that were very close to your home or in your home. We need a place where children can come and be with their instructor. If your home is the right place, so be it. And then the program that we had in Lucknow moved after three months in the community to six months in the school. This was how the bridging was being done. By that time, the kids were so fond of their instructors and the whole family of the instructors now knew the kids that it was inconceivable that the instructor should not go with the kids to the school. And I remember brothers and fathers saying, only to the school, okay, no further. But then, as these women gained confidence, they fought their own battles at home, and many of them then, not everybody, but many then moved further. But I think having a group probably helps. And within any group, there are some people who are willing to fight and go a little bit further. I, I remember another young woman from Delhi. We were going to start our work in another city, and we were looking for people. And she came to my office and she said, can you please tell my family that you are sending me? Because I want to go, but if I say so myself, it won't work. And then I said to her, you've never lived away from home. You're going to go away and live somewhere far away. Aren't you nervous? She said, I don't care, but if I go, then my friends can come after some time. I have to be the successful one so that others can follow. So I think there are exam, I mean, I think in every community, there will be some people who will want to go further. But step by step, I think, is how it works. On the state government front, what are the sort of lasting effects of having worked with teachers? It probably needs a great deal of research to figure that out. But I would say that our relationships with many state governments in India have been on again, off again, depending on what is the program, what is the current policy context. But what I would say is that everywhere that you've worked, with every wave of work, you make some friends. And these friendships are revived in the next round of work that you do. Sometimes the work is very closely aligned to what the state government wants to accomplish. Sometimes it's a little bit off what their priorities were. But we think of all of this as a long game. It's a, uh, we say, there's a proverb in Hindi which says you are a horse for the long race. Not for the, this is not a sprinter, it's going to be a marathon. And if you look at the relationships you build along the way, perhaps that's the, that's the way to go. On corruption, see, we have never been really, there is corruption, clearly. But if you're not in construction, you're not in procurement, this business of teaching and learning doesn't, where is the corruption there? There is a corruption of time. You're busy drinking tea forever. <laughs> uh, but I think that we've actually, we've had contracts with state governments which eventually they pay up. You have to be, you, the, uh, the real issue in working with state governments has been when there is a transaction, when there is some money that is owed to you, you must have enough liquidity to sustain your troops till the money comes. But rarely have state governments defaulted completely. But then we are also not in a business which has, like say for example, in programs that we do right now, if there's a lot of printed material, we rarely say we will print it and give it to you. It's better that they spend their own money and get it printed themselves. So whatever is the process to do that, let it happen but not involve us. So we are known to have not much money in hand and we are known as people who will make other people work. And I think that's the extent to which, you know, so very surprisingly, very little first-hand dealings with money corruption. With other kinds, yes, but then you can argue and debate and deal with those in, you know, in that way. I think actually because we're we're, we're running a little behind time. I'm going to ask our panelists to come up. And uh, Rukmini ended her talk by um, mentioning how important it is to link up the broad global goals to local, local Gs or uh, local goals. And today we've got a panel uh, of, of uh, women coming from different parts of civil society, and some of you will know that it's been an interest of mine over many years to understand how non-state actors can influence educational change, and as not only at the local level, but also at the global level. So today we have with us um, Rukmini, of course, Bela Raza Jamil, coming from AITA, uh, the Center for Education and Consciousness. I won't attempt it in Urdu. 
<laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> and uh, Mary, Mary Goretti Nakabugo, coming from Uganda, who is the country coordinator for OASO in that country, um, and Mary Metcalf, who is the chair of the board of the Open Society Foundation Education Support Program. So this is going to be a moderated discussion. I am going to open by asking each of the members of the panel to make a small statement or answer a, a big question with a small statement. And, and then I'll be uh, receiving questions from the audience, but also inserting a few questions that we've spoken of beforehand to give everyone a chance to share their views. So the first question uh, that I want to pose to this panel, and we'll, go, we'll start with Goretti and move our way across, is um, in your experience, looking backwards on the Millennium Development Goals and looking forward to a new set of global goals, how relevant are, is global goal, goal setting? Thank you very much. All right. Um, I think goal setting is pretty relevant because in a way it keeps countries on their toes. I mean, if you know that Everybody's watching. I mean, we're all working towards the same goals, and everybody is watching. Then you are kept on your toes. Uh, what I see, for example, with the MDGs of the 2013, so 2000, and uh, the global monetary reports that have been coming out, they, they somehow keep countries on their toes. So, global goal setting is really very important. It's very nice to have something to work towards. The only question and problem that I have is the process of setting those goals. And of course, the culture of non attainment of those goals. So, the process, we all know that it has always been a little bit excessive. I'm talking now from the context of the African continent, and maybe specifically for Uganda, is that this process has always been externally driven from the north. The southern people, participate quite passively, mainly through the UN. Look at the debate that we are having in the post-2015. The lobbying and setting up of the agenda actually started 2009, 2010, 2011. In some of our countries, this debate started only last year, towards the end of last year. So by the time they come on board, almost the agenda has already been set. So the process is, is where I have a problem. Look at the culture of non-attainment. This is not the first time we are talking about goal setting. Right from 1961, on the African continent, heads of state met. 59 years down the road, 53 years down the road, we are talking about the same things that we are set in 1961. So after 1961, I mean, there was this goal of expansion of quality education for all. Come 1990, in Thailand, and the same goes very nice words, access to quality education, learning outcomes, they were there. That agenda was completely thrown away. 2000, set another agenda. 2015, we are setting another agenda. So maybe if we can't attain them, then we shouldn't say them. Um. I think um, Mary has uh, articulated it very well. Um, I've been on both sides, uh, worked with the government um, in Dakar, and you know that whole excitement of setting goals and feeling that we are a part of it. And worked also as a um, as an advisor, technical advisor to the Ministry of Education in the articulation and the designing of the sector reforms, etc. And then, of course, uh, the disillusionment. Um, as we see that um, whilst the goals and targets are set, um, the implementation gap and the trust deficit keeps on expanding, um, you know, you become cynical about some of those things. Also in countries where uh, the ODA and the donor funding is not more than 10 perhaps, 10 percent perhaps, the compulsion from the, or the ownership from the government side Obviously, um, or the imagination is also not there. Um, so whilst you know you have countries like Bangladesh who have come up with their own position on um, post 2015 as a kind of a liaison between government and civil society, 
In Pakistan, the process has been uh, as a rather patchy. As civil society organizations um, who've been working at fixing our own backyards, so to speak, um, and especially uh, with uh, the Asar tool, as it were, and the move, we call it a social movement, um, obviously uh, things become far more concrete and tangible, uh, which need to be addressed. Um, we've been rather opportunistic and taken implemented approaches to wherever we are called or wherever we can make a noise to make sure that learning uh, is somehow given the kind of attention that it needs um, and especially make the government also become more wary and more um, appreciative that you know it's not you know access has to be somehow put on the side and the number of children that you may have in school, um, Yasser's recent report says 90% of children 6 to 10 are in some kind of schooling. But when you look at learning and have 50% children in class 5 not knowing grade 2 level um, learning competencies and basic literacy and numeracy, well, you know, that's your challenge. So how do we negotiate at different forums as civil society? Right, as I said, starting from our own backyards, from the parents to teachers to education departments to planning commissions wanting to put Vision 2025, I think that's very important. Also, I think this whole business of the interface of what are seen as the global um, agenda setting spaces to the local agenda, spacing, uh, agenda setting spaces, uh, where you have government talking about Vision 2025, or where you have the enactments or the uh, constitutional provision for right to education of 5 to 16, in many ways, um, they, are, they are ambitious goals being set even within the country of providing quality education to ch all children 5 to 16 years of age, with a provision also on inclusive inclusion. Uh, now, all that is very well, but how that has to be done? So a bigger fight is being fought you know, on the home ground. Now, how that gets into uh, into um, uh, faced with what is happening globally or regionally, um, that I think even there we feel sometimes that we're being co-opted as technical people from the civil society to become interlocutors between the government and the other outsiders that they may be at different years. We do realize that um, there is somewhat of a um, mechanical approach to the UN agencies working through this, um, this, this protocol or the hierarchical protocol of coming from the government. The consulti you see there's consultation culture to the, I mean we've been testing that to the nth degree and it has become a fine art. You do consultations at the government level, the civil society, the academics, so you have it all. It's a kind of a set template. Uh, and even that set template comes with sometimes preconceived outcomes because it has to be done so. Um, and, and in a country like Pakistan where you are addressing issues of security, of voice, of agency, of um, rights, um, of gender, so many things, and of financing of education, somewhere we do not know really what finally will be settled by the so-called UN agencies who have this mandate globally to be able to meet those deadlines. Now, all of you are aware in this audience of you know what those deadlines have been from 2012, 13, and 14, how and kind up to 15, and how many spaces you need to occupy. And you know that the most important ones are going to be in New York and Washington. Now it means some of us who've been asked, oh, are you going to be there? Are you going to be there? And you know, we say, oh my God, are we going to have time to be able to implement what we should be doing? Because that's our first and fundamental obligation as Rukmani so beautifully art articulated. What are we doing in our own backyards? How are we going to set this right? And to some extent, I think we have that satisfaction that it is because of the work we do and when we are called, say, to Brookings or to the April meetings or whatever, or even here, and we can share some of our work, it is what, where we are grounded that carries the most weight. We are practitioners, we are thinkers, we are doers, we are innovators. 
we uh, challenge ourselves all the time, what is going right and what is not going right. But I think also uh, we recognize that uh, we have to also um, uh, take into account the kind of uh, conversations that are going on on the post 2015 agenda. We have to be able to make sense of the local conversations with the global conversations. We have to be able to ensure that in all of that, the South-South voices um, are heard and that we do win the day when it comes to uh, the binaries of household, uh, school-based versus household-based assessments. Uh, and so on and so forth, and try and push the agenda that this is, this is, and the way we are seeing education unfold in our countries, we are seeing many, many players. We do not see just the public sector, we are seeing you know, many non-state actors. We do not see, even amongst the non-state actors, the kind of binaries that we like to come to be see. We don't always see that this is a neoliberal agenda to see um, non-state um, provision of education um, uh, simply because uh, this is leading to privatization, we see the rise of many trust schools. We see the rise of uh, um, organizations who are trying to do something or become a bridge between improving the public sector and community and the private and the household choices that must be made. So I think it's, a, it's complex. It's something that I think um, we are taking cognizance of. It's not that we feel that uh, there is a conspiracy out there. But I think there, it is a complex environment of home setting. It is a very nuanced um, um, uh, uh, role play that we have to do between what is seen as very important uh, milestones within the country and holding the government to account for the kind of constitutional provisions that make for right to education and the gap between making those provisions and not doing uh, and having wars take place at that end and negotiate as best we can, but also try to see that what is being set inevitably as global goals, that we are able to find enough space to be able to work with people who can, who can, um, uh, who can uh, uh, be sensitized to the issues that uh, we want them to address in the, in the challenge of learning and learning for all. Um, we feel that there is, at the same time, there's a communities of practice out there in so many, at the local level, at the regional level, and at the global level. We feel also that the civil society, which is across the world, is also gathering together, not just in South-South, but also North-South, which is uh, becoming a, which is indeed a very happy situation to be in, where you can call upon friends to work on technical solutions uh, even at local levels. So I think um, there, there is vibrancy certainly in all of this, but uh, there, there choices need to be made on how we look at the local and the global. How do we ensure that um, the, the core challenges that we face in our own backyards uh, get um, the space that they deserve in the uh, global uh, agenda? Um, and some of us, in our own ways, in our personal capacities and our institutional capacities, are also, also very um, humbled by the fact that we are represented in the global um, um, in the global community through the Global Monitoring Report or the UNESCO Institute of Statistics or in the Brookings Institutions or in so many places where we are called to uh, give a voice. So while we are very acknowledge, we acknowledge that space very much and uh, feel that uh, there's an obligation that we carry and a responsibility that we carry to ensure that uh, the issue of learning remains at the center of this debate and with it, of course, the issue of equity and inclusion. Thank you very much, Karen. Um, I think education is a project that those of us who maintain our idealism and hope uh, find that that's what sustains us. And so my response may be a little bit hopeful and a little bit idealistic. But I would say that the MDG process is very important because um, the goals that are set do not implement themselves. They are a framework that must enable the agency of others in specific contexts. 
and it's the expression of the struggles in those contexts that, um, for me, must be what the NDG provides the energy for. So, if you look at the key stakeholders, I am going to talk briefly about government and then I'll talk more about civil society. Is I think that the NDGs provide for government a perspective of development in, in a multi sectoral context. And that means that um, for, a, for a Minister of Education within the Cabinet, he or she has the support of those intersecting components of the NDGs to strengthen their arguments and to assist in the prioritisation of, of education. It also sends a very strong message within government that education problems can't be solved independently of the other problems in society, in as much as education also contributes to the successful resolution of other problems in society. So for governments, I think the MDGs are important because it frames education as a critical component of development. And for that, I think we should be pleased. In terms of civil societies, I think, and I've seen, um, in, in communities, um, in, in, in distant rural areas of South Africa, but I know it to be true internationally, that what the indigenous do is that they provide a, a sense of connection between individual problems and global aspirations. And that's what empowers and provides the engine for the kind of agency at local, family, domestic, and um, community level to be able to recognize that what the global goals are talking about relate to my individual problems, my child, my communities, and problems. And that enables, therefore, the, the sense that if we hold these goals to, to our hearts, we have the authority of the global to support our mobilizing efforts, and we're not alone. I think the global goals are important because um, what, they, what they do is that by them being adopted by um, countries that are, that are part of the United Nations, it's a recognition that those countries um, are accepting the obligation of the rights to which they're committing themselves to. And that means that as a citizen of a sovereign state which has accepted this goal, I claim the right to myself. And as in claiming that right, and this is a really important point for me, is I'm going to claim that right as a citizen of the sovereign state, not as a consumer. But it's a, it's a goal that my country has subscribed to. Now, why that's important is it then provides a framework for civil society at every level, firstly to, to assist them in articulating their, their, their troubles in, in terms which they can benefit from how the articulation has developed with the, with the participation of so many people across the world. It certainly helps with mobilization. And it's, it's, I've heard people in communities say that the Millennium Development Goals say this, and this is what it means for us. I've even heard um, politicians at provincial level starting the um, description of their goals for their province from the Millennium Development Goals. So it frames all of that. I think that thirdly in terms of how it frames action is that the global monitoring of the companies, the uh, implementation particularly of EFA, gives communities access to evidence-based arguments of how they do it and the relative performance across the world and the sense of belonging within that. So, very importantly for me, it's, um, it's a global promise to say we are not alone. My local project draws strength from this greater community. And it's a component part of a larger project. What I'm doing here contributes to um, what's happening across the world. And it builds that sense of solidarity and the confidence to proceed. And I think lastly, it also means that in taking forward that set of obligations, one is also accepting the responsibility that you're signing up for to make that contribution. I think
lot has been said already. I just want to make uh, one point that uh, last MDG was really a schooling goal. And in some sense, when that goal was formed, many countries were well along the way of having articulated these as national goals. And so an international goal was not, yeah, perhaps not still in many cases. But the new goals that will be formed for education seems like must have learning embedded in them in some form. And I think in that sense, on the one hand, it provides an opportunity to really think about what that means for your own country. Uh, have the flexibility to be able to define. I mean, in India, for example, we don't have consensus on what this learning means and for whom, but there are at least debates that need to be started on how will we conceptualize and then operationalize and actually move towards some of these. So I think that it's going to be different. I think the game that has been played so far is going to be different as we look ahead. And I often look at the malnutrition problem. It's not Building schools, hiring teachers gets you towards certain schooling goals perhaps in an easier way than solving the problem of learning or the problem of malnutrition, which needs a whole more set of complex things. Not governments and expenditures alone will solve these. It will require a lot of work on everybody who is... Uh, and I'm reminded often of uh, discussions that which are quite common, uh, but uh, I remember being outside a government school somewhere in India and there was a group of mothers and asking, you know, whose school is this? And they all together said, this is the government school. So, whose money runs this school? And they laughed at me and they said, it's a government school, so government's money runs the government school. So, there's a problem with the school, the government should come and fix it. So, in that kind of relationship where you expect the government to fix the problems, there are some problems that can be fixed in that way, but there are others that are going to require a great deal of much more integrated work for people, whether it's in the local community or the global community, to participate to reach that outcome. So I think that it will be very interesting to see what the next education goal is and what will be the ways in which we get to that goal and I feel it's going to be very different from the last few years. I'm going to ask one more question of the panel. And, uh, the question is, so if you got the chance to shape a new goal, what would it be? What's the one piece of a new goal for education that perhaps is not in the conversation but it should be more amplified in the current debates about uh, a new set of goals for education? Um, let's start in backwards order. So, can we... so I have no time to think about this. <laughs> Quite typical of the way we make goals. Uh, <laughs> I would suggest, I mean, with having no time to think, I would say that I think learning for all would be a good goal, uh, but I would leave it to individual communities or states or however countries are organized to define what that means for themselves. And I think the first set of goals that you have to stick to is the goals that you set for yourself and see if you can reach those first. So you have to own the goal. And therefore, you have to own progress towards those goals. And perhaps once you do that, a whole set of things will look much more similar than if you were given a goal to that. I think I would say that uh, there needs to be some clarity about central principles because a lot of the skirmishing is on the periphery of those principles. And the fundamental principle that needs to be asserted is that education is a public good, a basic right, and central to um, the kind of equity that's needed for your development. And if that was agreed upon, a lot of the other debates would be easier to resolve. Um, I was, um, when Karen asked her some questions, said, you know, this is something that I'm going to ask you, I was just scrambling and saying, okay, what have we been doing for the past one year? And recently we were asked to be a part of the Vision 2025 exercise of the Planning Commission. And, um, and we were supposed to come to this exercise in Islamabad from wherever we were on our own resources and not ask for government's money or so on and so forth. So we um, sat there for about three hours uh, fighting over what should be a part of the Vision 2025 um, we tore apart whatever the government had put down as their vision 
and this group of about 100 people who put together something, and I'll just read that out to you, because when the, the Planning Commission sent us um, uh, what they thought was our discussions uh, that day, uh, we said, oh my God, this is putting us 15 years backwards, not forwards. And um, so we again revamped and said, this is what we had. And I'll just read that to you. And we said, um, a society where every child, youth and adult, without discrimination, has access to learning embedded in 21st century approaches for inclusive, sustainable, personal, personal social and economic growth at local and global levels through partnerships. I know it's, it's like a mouthful, but the point is that yes, it, it, there has to be a sense of equity, there has to be a sense of a lifelong learning process, not something that just stops, because the MDG uh, in 20, uh, 2000 its biggest problem was how it constrained even access to primary education. And as a result, you know, that in itself was a recipe for disaster. Because, uh, you know, clearly that was a very confining moment. Um, and we've seen the results of that in the learning crisis. Um, so I think something which gives that kind of space to not just a child, but to everyone, who must participate in, in learning uh, because we see sometimes when you look at the crisis of learning, it's not just the crisis of learning in children, it's a crisis of learning in adults and teachers, which, you know, excludes so many. So anyhow, this is what we had and I thought, you know, let me just share what we shared with the government and said this is what, not just, and in that day it was not just civil society, it was a large range of stakeholders present uh, in Islamabad, you know, fighting for their claim for what should be Vision 2025 from an education perspective. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and like I said in the beginning, is that um, to be honest, the, the two education goals that are already in the current agenda, I think they are still relevant. So, so what I could do is to kind of maybe make them sharper and refine them. And again, I think we shouldn't be looking at just having one education goal. Just like we had in the previous agenda, I think we should have two goals, or even three, because education is so important. So the first goal that I would have there is, my colleagues have already said, the equitable access to education at all levels, and especially focusing that on the marginalized. So much as we say that a lot of attainment has been made in enrollment, there are so many children out, out there. I think the recent Global Monetary Report is talking about 57 million children out of school. So those we should actually reach out. But most importantly, in addition to that access for all, the learning agenda. Ensuring effective learning outcomes for all children at all levels. But bringing in the gender aspect, like the previous goal that we had, I think we should specifically focus on ensuring that girls and boys have an enabling learning environment wherever they are, so that we don't lose out on that gender aspect. So the third goal, maybe others can think about. But I think we also need a goal which ties across all the other goals, because we know that the attainment of other goals will really mainly depend on on education. So maybe we also need another cross-cutting goal on education to attain other related goals. So I think we'll take the few questions from the audience we will have them. Uh, Steve, I'll take three. So Steve, anybody else who wants to put up their hand? We'll just start with Steve and see if we can kick the ball off. Okay, <coughs> Steve. Steve. Uh, hi, Steve Cleese, University of Maryland. Uh, as the first speaker pointed out, uh, we've been making these uh, international promises since the early 60s, if not before. And we postponed EFA from 2000 to 2015. We're about to postpone EFA and the MDGs to 2030. And I want to ask the panel, do you see any underlying structural problems <laughs> that, that have limited our progress? And if so, what are they and what do we do about them? I think you should answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I'll take, there's one question at the back, so we'll take that one as well and we'll get to make the panel answer. Sorry to keep you waiting. Uh, the microphone was having its own mic. Uh, I'm just following up on what Doctor. Uh, my name is JJ Moses Okorut, and I'm, I come from Uganda. And I'm just following up on what Doctor Nakabuko said in relation to the lack of participation in the process of designing the goals. And I would like to extend the whole process debate a little bit further to the actual process of trying to achieve the goals as in itself having a problem. And here specifically I'm talking into the lack of say coordination and collaboration among the different stakeholders. I think oftentimes we find people uh, or let's say the education government parties, them call them that way. Doesn't matter whether it's government, national, international operating in kind of compartments. Yes, it is easy to say that you are working so on and so on so closely, but I'm just a little bit looking at, at effective coordination and collaboration in the process of trying to achieve those goals. I think I personally see a big problem in there that, that what, I, what I would like to call effective coordination and collaboration, which then for me would help take care of all these this problem we talk about of lack of accountability, lack of uh, lack of responsibility, and corruption. I believe if there is effective coordination and collaboration, both locally, nationally, and internationally, then I guess all these other problems, which which hamper, get minimized. I know uh, before uh, I, I forget. I know it's, like, it's not an easy thing to achieve at all those levels, but I think. Generally, attempts should be made to, 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 to facilitate uh, coordination and collaboration. Just on a bit to take on that. Thank you so much. Father Arnold, uh, Indiana University. The panels have spoken about education as a public good and as a human right. I think of a recent dissertation by my colleague here, Zelia Babaji Wilhite, about human rights in education. One right being the maternal language, the right to have an education in your language that respects your culture. And to that, since we're bringing up the gender issue, a right to an education without violence, without violence, especially against girls. So, panelists, uh, we'll start with the uh, ready and stuff. We don't have to answer all the questions, we <laughs> pick and choose. <laughs> You know, I'll try to avoid the, the question on the structure of problems and leave that to my colleagues to answer. <laughs> but this, uh, the second question was more or less a comment, which I entirely agree with. Uh, there is no way how we can attain whatever goal we, we choose to set without that coordination and collaboration. But again, this takes us back to the previous agenda that we had. We already had a goal there on global partnership. How far did we grow it? But, but maybe actually, again, to emphasize what the speaker has just said is that it's actually because of that global partnership goal that we had that has enabled most countries actually to reach where they are. For me, deep inside my heart, I know the attainments that we have made in Uganda, the huge enrollments, the infrastructure development. We wouldn't have attained that much if there was no that global partnership and the kind of support that we have get from the international community. So that collaboration and coordination globally but also nationally has to, to be there. Uh, what um, the previous speaker, I forget your name, uh, has talked about, I think we can decide to have as many goals as possible on education. I think the list is quite endless because the right to education is very important. Talk about the right to learn in your language. 
But where I think most of these goals are taking us to is the issue of quality, the issue of attaining learning outcomes. Because for, for a few years in Uganda, we have, we have been doing assessment of, of, of learning outcomes within the weather. The issue of language actually comes in, in which language are the children instructed. It all goes back to the issue of learning outcomes and quality. So we can have as many goals as possible, but some, somehow we have to focus on what matters most and where the others will actually contribute more. I think um, the question on structures is the most important one. Uh, in that is embedded the response to the other two as well. And I think where governments and obviously um, the problems that we associate with goals is where governments are clearly not committed to the goals. Whether uh, those goals, and we can take them from the global goals to the national goals, whether they are set in the constitution, as rights-based fundamental uh, goals, um, is when the governments um, have not really made a decision on how important education is as fundamental human right. And when there is no decision of that kind, you see also a lack of imagination on how to spend the 90% resources that the government, in the case of Pakistan, spends on education, because only 10% comes from ODA, and even that, we see that there is no clear insight or um, uh, path that the government treads upon to see, okay, this is what we are going to achieve, uh, this is what, um, where we've gotten to, some kind of stock taking to then decide where to go next and what to set right if something is wrong. I think that leads to not just uh, one kind of structural problems, but a host of structural problems. And, and when that happens, then you have violence of all kinds, not just the most obvious ones, but even violence where you are obliterating mother tongue languages, You're, you become an alien to your own culture and your own context. That violence is in intergenerational violence and a cultural violence of great proportions that takes place when the governments who are in power or people who have been put in power, even in democratic settings, are un or incapable or have decided to really um, resort to the ultimate corruption of completely undoing the, uh, the confidence that was placed on them when people elected them and put them in place by ensuring that you know people do not have that access do that right to learning and education in the most culturally sensitive manner and the most, or what, or what you, what I should say, most humane manner that is possible. Because in the countries where we live, we have on the one hand one of the most developed um, histories and legacies of culture, art, thinking, ideas, you know, going back to 11,000 years BC and beyond. And yet we have the kind of poverty that looks us in the face and the violence that looks us in the face. I don't know whether there is any shortcut to that. The governments have to make up their mind. They cannot keep on cheating on people anymore. That's the kind of job that we do from time to time as civil society, bringing this in front of the governments. And frankly speaking, we tell the government that we have lost you know, I'm, we are sorry, but we do not respect you anymore. And say it very openly, when you cannot be answerable to the constituencies who vote for you, and you can continue to behave in this manner, and you continue to negotiate loans when your indicators keep going down from the World Bank of $300 million and $400 million which generations have to pay, and without those people having any say, on how you're going to organize the delivery of these services, but more importantly, the right to learning and the right to be taught. So I'm going to take them, Stephen, first, and then your question, and then I'm going to come to, I, I didn't catch your name, but I think it was Moses. So for, for Stephen, uh, I think you really are better placed to, to answer the question, but for me, uh, I don't think we can achieve these goals in conditions of growing inequality, 
growing poverty and increased marketization of education. And the inequalities and the poverty is growing within countries and across countries. And it does not provide the fertile ground for the achievement of, of goals that the world needs it to. Um, for, for the question about uh, maternal language and uh, uh, no more gender violence as a right, I, I want to acknowledge a conversation I had with Nikki Stan um, this week that helped me a lot because there are, there are multiple rights. But I think that what's helped my thinking is to say that there's probably three central rights which frame the rest, and then you can take forward a conversation. And the central rights are obviously the right to education, the right to liberty, the right to dignity. And if we accept those three, and there may be others, so I'm looking forward to a conversation with everyone as well as with you, um, is that that frames the realization of rights in different contexts. Now, you use two different examples. I passionately believe in first language instruction, but I would accept that working on the principles of equity, equity, education in different contexts, people may make different choices, and I would support that. Gender violence under no conditions ever, and what did one not say, that the right to dignity for the not such a thing. So now I want to come to Moses' question, which um, I want to take it country level. Because as I understand what Moses was asking, he was saying, how do we um, how do we coordinate, how do we cooperate? And I think at country level, it, it's going to be very different, um, depending on the relationships between stakeholders and how they frame the dialogue. So where there's distrust, where there's dishonesty, where there's denial, uh, where there's even um, oppression, you'll have a very different um, conversation. But again, going back to being the idealist, I would say that having um, the MDGs and the EFA goals should um, empower a conversation which says, these are the goals, these are the targets. What are we going to do here? What's realizable? Um, how are we going to realize that? What resources we will we need? What are the time frames in which we're going to um, achieve these? And uh, it, it should enable a conversation which also looks at the annual reporting as is required in the work and make sure that the promises that have been made are kept and when they're not kept, that there's an explanation, that there's a publicly available explanation for the legitimate reasons and non-legitimate reasons about why they haven't um, been kept. So I think that that framework should, in its best form, enable that conversation for um, coordination. It's a bit of a long session. A lot of serious things to think about. Um, I would just like to uh, come back to the point that I made. And it's clear, it's getting clearer across the world, um, more in some places than perhaps not as much in others, that children need to have a satisfactory level of learning to be able to function as citizens as they go ahead. Now, the schooling goal, in a way, and whether at the country level, or the regional level, or the international level, we kind of knew how to get there. The pathways for different types of communities had to be charted, but overall we had a sense of what is needed. I think the big crisis, or the big opportunity, depending on how you look at it, is how is learning going to be guaranteed. Uh, measurements are beginning to happen now, but you know, just if you measure the big, it doesn't get factored. As we go, there needs to be a lot of serious work done at every level about how to deliver, how you define learning, how you therefore then measure the learning, and then how you deliver it, and how that loop goes. So maybe having that as a global goal, or at least a global framework, will make many more people put their hands to the job to see what are the different pathways in it, in which this can get done. 
And I worry a little bit that the past history of the education goals will not be as helpful in this future. In some ways, I think we have to rethink this. Uh, you know, all aspects of what this goal is, the definition, the measurement, and the delivery, and how these are all related. So I want you to all join me in saying thank you to our panelists. Thank you to our panelists.